there. Welcome to the second interview at Software Architecture in Stream from OOP. Um, my guest is Rick Marcelis, and we are going to talk about quality engineering. When you have any question you like to ask, Rick, I will forward it to you. Please use the chat at YouTube or Twitch. So I would like to start with uh, the easy part, Rick. Um, could you please introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, thank you very much, of course. Well, my name is Rick Marcelis. I'm a principal quality consultant at Society in the Netherlands. And being a principal quality consultant means I do three different things. Uh, I do consultancy and coaching assignments for clients, uh, mainly uh, part-time, uh, uh, sometimes short-term, uh, like one or two sessions, sometimes for a longer period, um, but mostly uh, only one day a week. Second thing I do is uh, research and development, and uh, that focuses on the area of quality and testing. And I've been involved in research and development for about 20 years now. And the good thing of doing research is that you get new insights, new ideas, and are allowed to share these, for example, in talks like this with you. Well, that's uh, very nice. But also in, uh, for example, books. So uh, we created a book and I will probably tell a little bit more about it later. Uh, and the last thing I do is training courses. And that is obviously also in the area of quality engineering and testing. And it's both specific training courses for uh, organizations, but also uh, certification courses where people can take an exam and then it's more standardized course. And I'm one of the people who created the TMAP certification scheme that was launched. Uh, it's now one and a half year ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, TMAP is part of quality engineering or was it what is TMAP exactly? TMAP is the body of knowledge for quality engineering and testing. And well, actually to give you a little bit of history, that's the good thing of having my whole bookshelf at hand. The, this is the very first TMAP book. And by the looks you may already see it's quite old. It is 27 years ago. And back then TMAP started as a method for testing. And today, uh, especially with the law, oh, now I can't get it back. I'll, I'll put it on my desk, I'll <laughs> store it later. But uh, today it's not just about testing, it's much broader. And that's also the subject of this talk eh, for what's a different thing. And it's, of course, the subject of my presentation on uh, Wednesday. So we are going to talk about this a little bit. Uh, your um, title is a bit catchy, I would like to say. It was quality engineering instead of testing. Why and how? Um, first of all, could you explain quality engineering to me? Well, what we mean with quality engineering is that people involved in IT delivery take joint responsibility for delivering the right quality at the right moment. So you want to have a cross-functional team with multiple people that together take the various tasks. And um, the difference, and, and that's also why my title, like quality engineering instead of testing, if you look at the history and The, the very first book I know about testing is this one, The Art of Software Testing by Glenford Myers. Th this book is from 1979, when even I were not in IT. By the way, I didn't tell that when I uh, uh, introduced myself, but I have been in IT for more than 40 years now. Um, but back then, Glenford Myers uh, defined testing as find the errors, then you can fix the errors, and then you will have perfect software. Well, a couple of decades later, Jerry Weinberg created this book, Perfect Software and Other Illusions About Testing. So Jerry Weinberg made us, uh, uh, it very clear that testing will not make sure that you have perfect software. And I think you will never have perfect software, but it should be good enough. And therefore with quality engineering, we try to Uh, both build quality in from the start and 
make sure that we get the right information about the quality level so that or we have confidence that it is good enough for the goal that we have, or when it's not good enough, then you have information to fix it. But back in the time of Glenford Myers, it was more like, we know there will be problems, but we will fix them at the end. And today we want to build quality in from the start so that we don't have to fix at the end. So yeah, that's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. Um, but you're saying um, in the title, instead of testing, um, are you really saying that uh, with quality engineering, you can um, leave testing behind? So no unit tests, no end-to-end -end tests, or is it just to get the audience inside of your talk? No, what I mean is uh, the, the main focus. Mm -hmm. Often people, when they talk about quality, they start with looking into quality uh, when testing. But you should start looking at uh, quality at the very beginning. And to me, testing is part of quality engineering, but it's only one part of quality engineering. So um, it, you should broaden the perspective to the whole IT delivery uh, uh, cycle and all the activities involved. Um, and by doing that, For one thing, you reduce the need for testing because often people feel a lot of need for testing because there are so many problems and they try to find all the problems and fix them. Um, and by building in quality, you need less testing and especially less retesting. On the other hand, also um, some people think that testing is to be done by a certain group of people and other people do other things. And we argue that in quality engineering, everybody should work together and just create the stuff they need. And of course you need to do some testing. But I think that uh, like a decade ago or so, there was an awful lot of focus on testing and everybody tried to make us believe that testing was the most important part of IT and basically, I think testing is not that important. And here who's saying it, eh, because testing is, is uh, of course part of who I am, but still um, basically uh, if you build perfect software, you don't need testing. Now it's impossible to build perfect software. So you always will need some testing, but don't overdo it. Another thing is, do we need testers as separate people or not? And that's a huge discussion nowadays. And my simple uh, uh, yeah, statement is in a uh, modern agile or DevOps team, you need testing skills. You don't necessarily need people who call themselves a tester but you need to be able to do all the testing tasks that are needed. So you need some unit testing, you need some integration testing, probably you need some test automation, eh, especially for your regression tests. And also you will need some acceptance testing. Do you need a specific tester? Well, not necessarily. On the other hand, the interesting thing is that if you are a team and you need to build, let's say Java software, then nobody is surprised if you say, we need somebody who is specialized in creating Java software because we need to build it. And then when we need to do some testing, people often are surprised that you need somebody who is specialized in testing because then they say, oh, but everybody can test. Well, of course, everybody can bang some keys, but not necessarily is everybody able to actually do a real good test. So um, in the end, I would say we still need professional testing people, um, but then you have a discussion. And actually earlier today, there was a discussion on the internet with a group of uh, people, what should uh, yeah, quality and testing professionals be called? Do we call them tester? Because some people think tester doesn't sound very well. Should we call them? 
differently? Should we should we call them quality engineer? Well, some other people say, yeah, but what do you build at? Because engineer creates stuff. So is that the right term? Uh, in, in the US, often they call them QA, which then stands for quality assurance. And I often joke that QA is a perfect abbreviation because that's what uh, testers do all the time because it stands for quality asker, uh, uh, sorry, question asker, because testers ask que uh, questions all the time. And I think the basic idea is if you care about quality and are able as a team to have that, that care for quality, then you will be able to build things and create stuff that is very valuable. Um, yeah, and I think nobody in a team should only do testing and nobody in a team should do no testing at all because with responsibility for quality comes that you take responsibility together and then together you make sure that you do all the activities needed to ensure quality. Um, so, so you're um, also saying that quality engineering is something which has to be there from the start of a project, if I understand you right. So whenever I get or collect my requirements, there should also be the focus on quality. So which quality goals should I keep in mind when implementing this one? Um, but I think the um, um, most projects I know about, um, this topic is left behind till the end. So we find out, oh, performance is necessary because we have to deliver stuff in just in time or something. Um, so we should um, focus on performance right now. And that's, a, that's, that's too late. Um, I know this. Um, but I think there are many projects out there where the um, problems are already there. And maybe there are some people outside who hear about this quality engineering and think, wow, this is great, but I cannot restart the project right now and focus on quality. But uh, so uh, long story short, um, can I um, introduce quality engineering in a project which has already problems with quality or is it too late and there's no possibility for this? Well, let me give two answers. One is in a perfect world, of course, you care for quality right from the start. And luckily, I see more and more situations where that happens eh? because uh, people do refinements of user stories before they put the user story on their backlog. So they know it is uh, the right entry quality. Eh? It needs to comply with the definition of ready before you put it on your sprint backlog. Uh, and that's also a part of quality engineering. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are in a situation, and especially if it's a long, uh, a, a large, long-running project, then yeah, if somewhere down the line you find that there, sh there should be more attention to quality, of course you can still start adding ideas from quality engineering, and um, th there are many different things that support quality engineering. Now, one of the things I think is very important, what, what we did in the book is we, we made an appendix with the quality characteristics. And well, I'm, I'm not sure if people can see it on, on the screen. We have the quality characteristics from uh, the ISO standard. And here, here's a picture of the ISO standard. And um, it gives you functionality, which is something that everybody always thinks about because that is what the system should do. And you have seven non-functional characteristics being performance, compatibility, usability, reliability, security, maintainability, and portability. And these are things that, like you gave an example of performance, uh, often are uh, uh, missed in the beginning. But the sooner you think about them, the better. And in some instances, you just think about them and then say, okay, we don't need to worry about it. Uh, let's say portability, for example, when I started in IT, we just had uh, uh, two big mainframe computers and nobody cared about portability because if it ran on one mainframe, it also ran on the other mainframe and that were all the computers we had. 
so nobody cared. Today, with all these very nice uh, smartphones, yeah, portability is a huge issue. So probably if you are in a uh, 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 mobile app development project, people will have been thinking about portability. But if you are in a more of a legacy kind of project, well, maybe people have forgotten. And then it's good to ask the question, huh? is this something to worry about or not? And, and then I come back to the joke of question asker, huh? because that's often what people with a quality mindset do is just think of some things. And instead of thinking, probably it's not important, no, just ask, is this important? Um, yeah, and, and also when you want to change the way of working in a project, it, it's never too late to make small changes. Uh, you, you can't change the whole world on one day, but you can make small steps. For example, by doing uh, retrospectives in a, a, a better way, because I see often that uh, after a couple of sprints, people yeah, don't do real good retrospectives anymore. And the retrospective is the opportunity to improve together. And, and, uh, and another thing that I often notice is that in retrospective people, uh, they uh, go for the quick wins. So they want to have a change that will improve their situation uh, within the next sprint. And of course, if you decide to make, let's say, a template or something like that, then that can be done. But often the real improvements take more investment. And um, recently, for example, and uh, uh, I came across some people who struggled with testing and they said they had too many test cases. They didn't have time to run them all. And when we looked at their test cases, there were a lot of actually double test cases. Of course, they were not exactly double, but they were testing the same kind of uh, functionality. And I came up with the idea, why don't you look into test design techniques and properly design your tests? And they said, yeah, but that will take way too much time. I said, well, of course, like with every improvement, in the beginning, it will be a little bit hard. Eh? If you learn to ride a bicycle the first time you also fell over but after you have learned it it goes faster and better and you don't need to think about it and the same is for example with test design if you use test design techniques to properly design your test then with very few test cases you can have a good coverage and thus have good confidence in uh, the application um, and what people often forget is that Testing as such is not only dynamic testing, which is running the system, but also static testing like code reviews. And, and all too often I come across uh, developers who don't think code reviews are necessary or they don't want anybody else to look at their code. Um, and, and by the way, there are also very nice tools to do code reviews. And that is the first basic step towards better quality. Um, so, so you've shown the, um, the Dean stuff. I don't know if it's the right term. So the uh, performance and uh, portability and so on, they are pretty much goals inside of these uh, Dean norm. Um, but I know you, you can't focus on all of them in one project. You have to um, yeah, pick the cherries of them. You have to decide which are the, the most important one, ones for your project. Um, do you have any tips on how you can decide? I think you have to talk to the stakeholders perhaps, but um, are there workshop yeah. formats or something like this? Or do you have any tips on this? Well, uh, my first tip then is the so-called quality engineering strategy. Mm -hmm. And actually we do have a uh, template for that uh, on our website. Actually, I, oh, I, can share my screen. You can I? share your screen. So, um, let me do that. Uh, share screen. Uh, Chuck. And then share. Yeah. 
Okay, so you can see my browser now. I have gone to uh, tmap.net, which is the body of knowledge for quality engineering and testing. And then I'll go to templates and then I'll go to the quality engineering strategy table and I'll open it. Ah, oh, this is fun. Of course, it opens in Excel. So now I have to share my Excel screen. So just a moment. Yep. Um, and then of course, I hope Excel opens quickly. Funny thing is in 40 years, I have often heard computers will be faster, but still I'm often waiting for computers to perform things because they got faster, but also the tasks they have to do become more complex. So what is a quality engineering strategy? And I'll try to make it a little bit bigger. Oh, this oh. is too much. Well, this is okay. Um, the idea here is that we have some items and I better open the example. So we have a user story. Oh, now I have to increase the size again. And for a user story, we do a uh, risk analysis. And the first thing you need to think about is what are your important quality characteristics? So here we have a user story where we thought functionality and performance are the most important. So coming back to your question, of course, you can't focus on everything because then it wouldn't be focused. So in this situation, we decided functionality and performance is the most important. And we determined the risk for this user story for a specific quality characteristic. And usually uh, determining the risk is done with a quality risk assessment. Uh, you may know that as a product risk assessment, but we prefer to call it a quality risk assessment. And um, that can, for example, be done by risk poker, which is done together with planning poker. And if you have a risk class A, which is the highest risk, then you assign quality measures that go along with that risk class. And here we see that we have four groups of quality measures. And the first group is, oh, sorry, I'll skip the pop-ups. So the first group is the preventive quality measures. And that are quality measures that you do, so activities you do to build quality in. And an example there is in the first row is pair programming. So you have two people working on one piece of code and by doing that, it will be uh, higher quality. Um, the intensity we chose because of the risk class is indicated by the bullets. So three bullets is high intensity and pair programming is an example of high intensity preventive quality measure. We also have static quality measures, dynamic quality measures. They are known previously as static testing and dynamic testing. And we have corrective quality measures um, to change something afterwards. And an important example of corrective quality measures is refactoring. And so there's not a direct reason to change something, but refactoring is a good way of improving the quality of your overall system. So that is an example of how you could implement quality engineering. Um, and I don't think we have time to tell all the details, but well, if people like, they can just download this. Eh? Uh, the website tmap.net is just a free website. Eh? We, we like to share our knowledge because over the 27 years that TMAP exists, we have learned that sharing knowledge is much better, not only for the people that get that knowledge, but also for ourselves because a community grows. We get feedback, by the way, as you can see, this is a 0 0.8 version because it's still in development. So it's the first version that we uh, put public. But if people have feedback, then please let us know because we like to incorporate new visions, new ideas, and improve the quality of this product also. So uh, tmap.net is a good starting point for me to start my uh, journey in quality engineering. 
uh, yeah, I would definitely say so. Okay. Um, so we have five minutes left. Um, you are also, maybe you, you can uh, talk about your uh, tutorial on Friday in short. Um, so do I have to visit your talk on Wednesday to visit the tutorial on Friday or is it um, a totally different topic? Um, well, of course, it is both building on the same ideas, but the contents of both things are different <laughs> because my talk on Wednesday is about what is quality engineering? How does it align with Uh, various IT delivery models and also what's its relation to testing like we just saw. And my tutorial on Friday is about test design and about one specific way of test design because uh, in TMAP, uh, we distinguish two main groups of approaches to test design. One is experience-based testing, like for example, exploratory testing. And the other is coverage-based testing, where you can guarantee a certain level of coverage. And in coverage-based testing, there you find the so-called test design techniques that in a structured way deliver you your test cases. Now, in TMAP, and I'm not sure if I can quickly find it, but I think I will, um, we have distinguished um, four groups of test design techniques. And I'm quickly trying to browse through that picture. I hope it is a little bit visible, but we have four groups of test design techniques. Well, I'll, I'll read them out. <laughs> so the first one is process-oriented test design techniques. And that's, for example, uh, state transition testing or path testing. The second group is condition-oriented test design. And the difference between process-oriented and condition-oriented is, let's say we are testing the access to uh, a roller coaster in a uh, amusement park, which is actually the example from the book. Um, you need to be at least 120 centimeters. So small children are not allowed, so they look at your length. And to be uh, able to test that, you can, of course, just test based on the length. That would be data-oriented testing with, uh, for example, boundary value analysis. But you can also test the whole process of uh, this thing. So how do we uh, uh, let people in the roller coaster and we need to measure their length? And then we have different possibilities, whether they are allowed or not. Or you can look at conditions and specifically if there are multiple conditions. Now. The tutorial on Friday is all about condition-oriented testing. And there you will see that there are different uh, ways of coverage, different coverage types. And we will look into uh, modified condition decision coverage, which is uh, a combination of high coverage, but not too many test cases. So it's actually an optimal way of doing it. And sometimes people find uh, it's quite difficult. And normally in a training course, you learn uh, modified condition decision coverage in just like one hour. And I think one hour is too short to really get an idea what it's all about, especially if you need to integrate it in a test design technique like elementary comparison test that we are doing on Friday. So, um, I'm very happy that it is a full day tutorial because then people really can practice. I, I think we have five or six practical exercises and people can step by step uh, learn how to do it. And, and by really practicing, they well not only get the idea and the theory behind it, but also know how to do it. And of course, we will use some Excel templates that again, they can find on tmap.net because that's where we like to share all our knowledge. That sounds interesting. So we're nearly at the end of the time, but I would, last, uh, would like to ask you one last question. Um, if you could only give one tip to the audience to improve their software projects right now, what would this be? That would be take responsibility for quality together. So joint responsibility for everybody in the team 
and be aware that quality is not just the task of a tester. Quality is the responsibility of everybody. And um, also by having that focus, my uh, uh, experience is that it also will make the whole IT delivery process much more fun because it's not us against them, but it's all together creating something great. Very nice last word. Thank you very much for being my guest this evening, Rick. I had uh, very much uh, fun with your interview and um, I think it was very interesting. I hope the audience uh, thought the same about it. Um, yeah, and uh, I wish you very much luck for your talk and your tutorial. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, meeting everybody at the conference, although it's virtual. And uh, I hope to see a lot of people in my talk and my tutorial as well. And uh, thank you very much uh, for interviewing me. You're welcome. So bye. Bye bye.